Welcome to Speak Out. I'm Sandy Galef, a member of the New York State Assembly, and I represent parts of Northern Westchester and parts of Putnam County. And to, today we have a wonderful, wonderful topic. Um, and it's called Milestones in Political History. Herstory. 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 <laughs> I got it wrong. But with me is Dana White, the Austin Village historian. Thank you so much, Dana. So what is the topic? Uh, women's suffrage, uh, milestones in political history for herstory, herstory. Uh, for female politicians. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's such a really wonderful period of time that we're talking about. But let's just, let's get to know a little bit about you. You are the Austin Village historian and you've been doing that for a number of years now. Four years now. Four years. Mm -hmm. uh, how, did, how did you decide to venture into this activity? Well, I was... Um, I had a career, I lived in the city, or I worked in the city, lived in Austin as a magazine editor, and I'm still a, a journalist, and I'm still a freelance writer. And I was just interested in local history, and I was very involved with the Austin Historical Society. And uh, we actually did a project, a house tour on my street of historic mm -hmm. homes, and I got really into that. And I, um, you know, just was in love with all of the history that Austin has. Um, you know, from the prison, of course, which has its own fascinating 200-year history, the Leather Man, the fabulous old cemeteries that we have, um, the Austin waterfront. And so when um, Mayor Garrity took office in um, 2015, uh, she asked uh, if I would be the village historian. You actually, every mm -hmm. municipality is supposed to have one, so there's also a town historian as well. Right, that's right. A, that's Scott Craven. That's a different, right. but I'm, I'm the village. The village. I wonder if all uh, communities do. Um, they're supposed to. They're supposed just to, to yeah. keep keep the history alive. Yep. And, uh, and, and not everybody community, and not every community has a historical society building, though. No. Um, so, do you end up with a lot of files in your home? Um, I do have a lot of files. I, my office is an absolute mess. Um, and the Historical Society is an amazing resource for me. I don't know. I couldn't do what I do without their files. Um, they're still old school file cabinets full of paper. Um, but they also have amazing digital uh, resources in terms of photographs and the Slater collection. And my training um, as a magazine editor was to marry words and images. And so that's mm -hmm. what I try and do uh, as the historian, is I do a lot of research on images, and then I use them to help tell the story of um, a street, or an area, or a person, um, or uh, I did a 30-minute video on the history of Austin that, that came up all the way to the present. Um, and I think part of it was that, you know, I, I didn't grow up in Ossining. I wasn't born there. Uh, I moved there in 1991, so that's actually a long time ago. Uh, I had kids and I had a job, and, and then I just kind of said, wow, you know, there was all this amazing, uh, interesting history in my own backyard, right, almost literally. Right. And I just am always uh, myself learning something new. Right. Um, and I try and bring to it um, a storyteller's kind of approach mm -hmm. um, because that's um, when I write articles or I'm working on a novel, that's, you know, how you, you tell the story and right. it feels you get more involved that way than if it's just dry facts. Well, let's look at that political herstory. Um, we are celebrating a really wonderful period of time um, in, in the year 2019 of having women having the right to vote for a hundred years. But there was a lot of work <laughs> that went into that. <laughs> there was. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, that we've had the right to vote for, to me it's like only a hundred years, you know. Right. But I mean, the country isn't, isn't that old and it took a while to convince some people that we deserved it. But um, it really began, you know, New York State, it began in New York State, the fight for the vote for women, women's suffrage. Uh, began in upstate New York in 1848 mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. uh, a women's convention in Seneca Falls, and women's rights. You know, even in the um, you know in the early um, 19th century, um, were you know there were a few women who were saying you know we demand equal rights uh, under the law, and the Constitution didn't really give women right. those rights. They didn't give a lot of people right. rights. Um, so the Seneca Falls Convention was really the first place where. Uh, the women's vote became something that was uh, on the list of demands. 
Um, I was up there, I had the wonderful opportunity to go up there this summer. I've always mm -hmm. wanted to do that. I went up to Seneca Falls and they had this whole wall of the principles. Mm -hmm. Well, they put it together as a museum, but the, the principles that they had and um, women at that period of time um, didn't, didn't have, you know, they, if they made money, uh, if they had a job, their money went to their husband. Um, if, if their husband died, um, they still didn't have the ability to keep the property. Right. I mean, there were so many things that, besides voting, uh, not voting, um, so many other things no, that they were No, you didn't have denied. the right, you know, that's why the, the, the rights uh, for women were very much tied up with the rights for other people. Um, Susan B. Anthony, um, who was, is considered the, the godmother of, of really the, the 19th Amendment, um, you know, she was a, a Quaker from upstate New York and she was an abolitionist. Uh, and uh, also um, a temperance advocate, which um, mm -hmm. is a whole thing, but there was a big problem with alcoholism. Um, and um, so there was a lot of women who would join this movement against drinking alcohol. But then women's, the right to vote became part of this. Um, and so Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were probably the two figures early on who were most responsible for getting out this idea that women deserved um, to be equal to men in every, mm -hmm. in every way mm -hmm. because uh, pro um, uh, property was very much the basis of power. What mm -hmm. you owned mm -hmm. being a landowner right. was the basis of your power. So if you couldn't own land, you know, and you couldn't vote, um, who was representing the people so that you weren't voting for the people who were supposedly representing your your needs, mm -hmm. and so it was really they weren't. It wasn't there wasn't the representation right. that women felt they deserved. Um, Susan B. Anthony, after going to her house when I was up there, uh, apparently her bags were packed all the time, and she must have been on a train. I she don't traveled <laughs> constantly. <laughs> she and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were a team, and uh, Stanton uh, was married and had quite a few children, but she was considered the brains, and she was a great writer. So she would kind of uh, write a lot of the speeches, and then Susan B. Anthony, because she, she was a Quaker, she, was, uh, she wasn't married, she didn't have a family, so she was always out spreading the gospel. Right. Okay, right. and she was a very forceful, very, very powerful speaker. So they were kind of, um, I think one of them said that um, it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton would write the thunderbolts and Susan B. Anthony would deliver them. Um, and they were a very effective pair. Right, right. So they were doing all this, but it just, it still took more time. It just seemed like, I don't know, some of the history that, that I think you've seen um, is about what happened in, the, I always thought New York, as you said, New York was a leader, but there were all these other states early on that mm -hmm. were- Ahead of us. Ahead of us, yes, giving. We giving, were actually, New York was one of the last uh, to, um, give women the right to vote before the 19th Amendment was enacted. There were still 21 states or so that gave women no rights. Like, so it depended, but the, the Western territories, uh, uh, right after the Civil War, were the first to give women the right to vote in elections. Um, Wyoming in 1869, when it was wow. still a territory, wow. Washington uh, State, Montana, Utah, Alaska, when they were all still territories, and why is there's several theories. One is that, you know, life as a pioneer, especially if you're a woman, was extremely difficult, dangerous. Um, and they say the men appreciated the women more out west than they did in the northeast. But it may have been, too, that there were so few people that they mm -hmm, needed mm -hmm. every voting body they could get. Um, and so also the first woman elected to federal office in 1916 was from Montana. Uh, and actually the first female governor was Wyoming. And, and so mm -hmm. Colorado was the first state. Um, Wyoming and Colorado were the first two states to give women the right to vote in the 1890 and 1893. And right after that, three women in Colorado were elected to the Colorado State Legislature. Right. Were there women that ran and got elected that couldn't serve in any of these? Or were they Well, the weird thing is that... Even though women couldn't vote in elections, they could uh -huh. run for elected office. So they could be in the elected office, but they couldn't go out and vote in another election. No. So that's why there were right. women who ran for president in the 19th century. Um, in 1872, Victoria Woodhull uh, ran for president. She was kind of an eccentric woman who lived in New York and very intelligent and uh, very, um, 
very charismatic and they never counted her votes because they thought it was kind of a joke mm -hmm. but in 1872 it's the same year Susan B Anthony was arrested for voting in in that very election so you had the in 1872 those two sides of it the Susan B Anthony voted for Ulysses S Grant uh, not Victoria Woodhull apparently but um, did they count her vote uh, no. No, no. She was arrested <laughs> and put on trial for voting. Oh, okay. For daring to vote for president. And they fined her $100 and she refused to pay. So. Right. And, and that was that. And then she continued her efforts ever after. After the Civil right. you know, uh, after uh, the Civil War and abolition mm -hmm, was supposedly mm -hmm. solved um, or achieved, um, then women's rights became much more of a focus. But there was a lot of discord. Uh, in the movement, and um, maybe they didn't get as much accomplished because there were a lot of different factions that mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. felt, you know, that women should uh, have been written into the Constitution along with the Fourteenth Amendment, the right mm -hmm, to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, Susan B. Anthony was very disappointed uh, that um, they weren't given the right to vote uh, at the same time that slavery was abolished. Um, but she, you know, they fought the good fight, and um, it wasn't really until after 1900 that um, the movement really picked up speed and united. And um, in fact, um, the woman who, who really united the, the suffrage movement lived in Ossining. That was um, Carrie Chapman Catt, I believe. And um, she lived on um, North State Road, on an estate, uh, in, starting in 1919. But she was really, uh, she was from Iowa, and she lived in New York for a long time. And she succeeded Susan B. Anthony as president of the National American Women's Suffra Suffrage Association. And she came up with the plan for getting the uh, resolution for women's suffrage to be passed in the states. And that once they got enough oh, states, so, each state. Because so they went state by state right. instead of just focusing purely on a big on the big federal picture. And that actually worked. Well, you know what's interesting? I mean, we do that today in Albany. We have to think about other strategies. So, so in New York State, um, the vote was in nineteen seventeen. Yes, that's uh, was when the women were given the right, right to vote in New York. So what, what kind of campaigns were going on during this period of time? I, I think Well, I think after 1900, and there, about uh, several million women joined the movement. It was a genuine movement. And they marched. They marched down Fifth Avenue. I think we have mm -hmm. a picture of, of that. Um, they marched on Washington. Hundreds of thousands of women. I marched on Washington, but it was more recently. <laughs> um, they um, had hunger strikes, civil disobedience. Uh, they stood outside with signs protesting um, President Wilson. Um, and it was the same sorts of activist things we see today, mm -hmm. only now we have mm -hmm. social media to help were us they they were were a good They were arrested. They were put in jail. Um, in England, it was worse. It was more violent, but... Um, you know, they, they just, they, they, they didn't give up and they had a unified voice mm -hmm, that they could mm -hmm. speak with. And it just got to the point where enough states had enacted voting rights for women that the ones that were still holding back were mostly in the South and a few up in the Northeast. But, um, you know, it just became a matter of, um, they just couldn't ignore them anymore. Right, know? right. But What's so fascinating is, so the women do not have the right to vote to give them the right to vote. <laughs> no, they could not vote. They couldn't vote to give themselves a right to vote. Right. It had to be men. Yes. They had, they had to, to get male allies. They had mm -hmm. to get male allies to be, and get enough of them um, to change the whole scenario. Well, I have a feeling those male allies had wives who um, uh -huh. had very strong opinions about this as well. So we can't, we can't forget that. But, uh, um, but there probably had to be a lot of convincing back in those There were a lot of, of women who didn't want the right to right. vote, too. Right. I mean, it yes. was considered right. they would do these scare campaigns where if you gave a woman the right to vote, you know, next thing you know, she would be abandoning her babies and, you know, marching off with signs and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you'd never see her again. But, of course, that was that woman can actually have a job and children and vote. All at the same time, right? It's really amazing. Right. <laughs> well, it's just um, so. It, it we were even though we were kind of a late state, um, starting out early, but then being late. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we did have a lot of people just actually in this area, as you said, that were very involved in this. Is that because it was close to New York City, maybe? Do you think that that had anything to do with it? Well, I think New York's uh, history as a breeding ground for uh, the movement has generated, you know, a generation, especially lately, of really great uh, women politicians. Um, the first women elected to the state legislature was 1919, and they were from Long Island. Um, mm -hmm. The first woman from Westchester elected to the state Senate was, was the 1930s. Um, there were two real, real trailblazers from, from New York City, uh, and that would be Shirley Chisholm, who in mm -hmm. 1968 mm -hmm. became the first black woman to be elected to Congress, and she ran for president in 1972 and got about 400,000 votes. And then Geraldine so Ferraro. So 1972, she ran for president. Mm -hmm. That that yeah. was that was quite early. Well, there was a lot going on then. There and was her, a lot her going on with was, rights. Her tagline was unbought and unbossed. That mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. her. Well, there was. I mean, the women's rights movement had, was again had really you know sprung up and was very strong. And Bella Abzug mm -hmm. uh, in 1970 was the, she said the famous line. You know, this woman does belong in the House, the House of Representatives. Uh, so kind of women's lib kind of met up with women's rights and, mm -hmm. and uh, with political office. And um, Geraldine Ferraro, of course, was the first woman to run on a major party presidential ticket. Uh, Walter Mondale selected her mm -hmm. in 1984 to that be his vice president. That was a very exciting period yeah. of time just to have a first, it didn't matter about the politics, just the first woman, um, you know, to be running for vice president, um, and, and she we didn't and have course, a lot of people in that role. The debate with George W. Bush. She debated George W. Bush, uh, who was Reagan's um, vice president, um, and uh, George H. W. Bush. Right. I'm sorry, Pappy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she had a very famous debate with him, um, televised debate. In fact, um, the first time my husband met my mother. She was watching that debate in 1984. I remember mm -hmm. it quite well, but um, she she accused him of being patronizing, and and he was. But she she acquitted herself very well. Unfortunately, they didn't win. Um, but uh, she was really a, a trailblazer, and also the first Italian American, I believe, mm -hmm. to a uh, mm -hmm. woman to have achieved that high a, of a of a level in politics. Um, so uh, that was pretty exciting. Um, but now we have. Uh, you know, some great women um, who just got reelected. You know, um, there was, and it all kind of started, or another big push was 1991. And that is the scene, uh, the, the picture where the women are running up the steps of the, of the Capitol building. And in 1991, um, the Clarence Thomas hearings were, were going mm -hmm. on. Uh, these confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court. And of course, we mm -hmm. all know that Anita Hill accused him of sexual harassment. But we also know that the Judiciary Committee, I think, was sitting there and they were all men. And they were all men right? and they were, you know, so it just felt like, you know, what, is, what do we have to do to be heard? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, when they found out that the Judiciary Committee was not going to allow Anita Hill to testify and tell her side of the story, seven, um, seven congresswomen stormed the Senate. They ran up the steps, and one of them was Nita Lowy, our very own <laughs> Nita Lowy, in 1991. She had only been in office for two years, and Pat Schroeder was another, and um, I believe um, Dianne Feinstein was another, and uh, they demanded, they demanded that, you know, that she be allowed to testify and that she be given a fair hearing, and she did testify. Now we all, I don't know if she got a fair hearing or not, and he was confirmed, but that just sparked. A lot mm -hmm. of women got angry, and right. they started, if that sounds familiar, of well, recent history. Well, it actually <laughs> is, um, I mean, that's, the, so that was 1991. I remember running in 1992 for the, sen uh, the year assembly, of the woman, yes. and it was the year of the woman, and what, what happened in Westchester County uh, we had four women that got elected to the assembly out of the seven for our county, which was like totally unusual. Before that, I think there'd been one, Cecile yeah, Singer uh, from Yonkers. So um, it, it was just, and we actually had, the newspapers were following us around Albany because we were <laughs> kind of like a unique thing that the majority of New York State Assembly people from Westchester were women. And it was also Carol Mosley Braun was elected that year, mm -hmm, the first mm -hmm. uh, African-American woman senator. 
Um, so it was, it was a big deal. And that kind of began, I think, this increasing numbers of women running for office. And we really saw that in, in the midterms. There was a record right. number of women elected to the House. Um, and it helped get the, the majority back. So. Right. No, it just, it, it, we, but we've had periods of time. So it was 1992, the year of the woman, and then 2018 was kind of the year of the woman. And when you think about it. Once again, both, based on Supreme based Court on hearings. Supreme Court hearings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that, yes. Is, that is kind of a fast. Well, well, not all of that. Not all of that. Don't but. get us mad. I think that's the, you know, because when women get mad, they don't lash out, they act, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that we saw, you know, just some really tremendous candidates and we saw a lot of barriers broken. I mean, there were candidates who had did commercials um, breastfeeding their babies, you know? I mean, these kind of, which is like, some right. people just don't wanna, you know? I mean, this kind of, um, you know, embrace of their womanhood. Right. And, there was actually you know, somebody who ran for Congress that got the election law to change that they could use their campaign funds for child care as they ran. Um, and I don't remember who that was. It might have been somebody on Long Island. Um, but, but that was kind of a unique thing because campaign, uh, what you raise in a campaign has limitations on, on how you can spend it. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like spending it on a personal thing, but it was also uh, to allow somebody yeah, to be so able to run, run for office so yeah. that she could run. So I thought that was, that was um, somewhat unique. Well, that's what happens when you, when you get women in office is that you start getting laws uh, and policy that are women friendly. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. that's not always the case. Right. But uh, when those three women in Colorado were elected in uh, 1893, they really focused on, um, on legislation that would help um, other women, including, um, you know, girls and and uh, women with children and families, and so I mean that's the ultimate level of representation, isn't it? Is to have someone, a woman like you, in office, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. knowing exactly what you need. Right. Well, it has been true um, even throughout my years in, in office that the women have really taken on the domestic violence issues, obviously the sexual harassment issues. Mm -hmm. um, that we're still dealing with today, you know, we the the women have have promoted more of those and and childcare, frankly, because um, women are still there and responsible mm -hmm. for childcare, so it's still a part of it. But um, and so here in New York, um, well, we well we've had a well we we talked about Shirley Shirley Chisholm mm -hmm. from New York, yeah. uh, Geraldine Ferrara. Well, more recently, um, Andrea Stewart Cousins um, was, of course, um, is now going to be hopefully the uh, majority leader in the mm -hmm. in the state senate. Uh, she's from Yonkers. I mean, there are several women from the Hudson Valley, um, and uh, Shelley Mayer is also mm -hmm, from Yonkers, mm -hmm. and she just and she just won. And then it's interesting on the um, at the national level, of course, Kirsten Gillibrand just, of course, mm -hmm. won her Senate seat again, and she's kind of, people are asking her about running for president, and, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. Um, Alexandria, um, uh, the the young woman from, um, I knew Yorktown. I wasn't. Uh, Yorktown Heights, uh, Yorktown yes. Heights, she's um, the youngest woman elected to um, the House of Representatives, um, Ocasio-Cortez, and uh, she's just setting the place on fire. And then, um, there was also, uh, who am I missing? Um, well, a while ago, not too long ago, two Nita years. Nita Lowy, of course, just oh, got Nita elected Lowy, to right. her 16th and term. And she may be the head of the Budget and Appropriations Committee. And she was and one she, of those seven women in 1991, you know, right. insisting on being heard. Right. And then, of course, uh, two years ago, we had Hillary Clinton from Westchester mm -hmm. run for president. And she got more than 65 million votes. Right. Which to me is actually, I think, kind of the greatest milestone. That many votes is a lot. Right. It'll be very interesting to see when we will have a, a woman president yes, at some we will. point. Uh, the question is going to be when and, and who. Uh, and, who. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't know that answer at no. this point, but uh, it will be something to look forward to. Uh, can you imagine that the women way back then, 100 years ago or beyond, ever thought that a woman would run for president. I, I can't imagine that that was in, in but maybe it was. Maybe well, Susan B. Anthony thought about it. I think, it was. I think that was the it. ultimate goal. I mean, you saw women kind of trying to do it. 
Uh, in in uh, the 1880s, a New York woman, um, Belva Lockwood, ran twice mm -hmm. and actually got, that was the first time a woman's votes for president were counted. I'm not sure they expected a woman to necessarily win. You know, I'm not sure that, A, they could anticipate what the two-party system would look like in this country necessarily. Um, but I think in their wildest fantasies that there was definitely a woman sitting behind in the Oval mm -hmm. Office, not as the First Lady, but as as the as Madam President. And mm -hmm. um, so you kind of feel like it's taken certainly, you know, a long time, but change takes time. And um, I think that they'd be very happy to see what was happening in some in some respects and maybe not happy in others right i think um I, I haven't really counted the numbers in the new york state legislature but i think uh, in the assembly we're uh, 40 i think there are 42 out of 150 that are women mm -hmm. so you know we're pretty much we're you know pretty close to a third um coming up from like 25 percent that's about what's happened and at the national level with all the women who won house seats Right. It was 20% before. It's got to be 25 or more now. Right. So um, it is really added up. And we'll see, you know, what the issues are as, as they go forward, um, which is really great. Now, I know that um, there's, what are, what are some of the things that you looked at that were kind of unique and unusual that you found in your research? Any well, you know, Austin, of stuff? course, Austin was, had its own chapter of, um, suffrage chapter every community had its group of women who were fighting for the vote mm -hmm. and there was actually a march in 1913 up the albany post road from new york city to albany that went straight through ossining and um, the woman who was in charge of the ossining suffrage movement was named elizabeth underhill mm -hmm. and uh, yes underhill street in ossining is right. named for her for her family and she never married but she um, had a sash that said votes for women and um, in fact, I believe that you wore that same sash. I did. I've worn it on two <laughs> occasions. Uh, I showed a movie about the, the whole issue of women's rights and Bill Reynolds um, mm -hmm. had that sash that I wore and then um, you had given a great presentation and I put it on again. Feel very good about wearing a sash that came from somebody long ago that was there to get our rights so that we And that is in vote. the collection of Bill Reynolds, who's a local presidential historian and right. knows more about it, all that than anybody. Yes. So he's very proud of it. Right. Dana, thank you so much. Uh, it's just a fascinating topic uh, to learn about her, her story, uh, history. <laughs> and uh, look forward to all of your other discussions on different uh, topics. And if somebody wants to invite you to come in and talk about these issues, I am sure that you are available to do that. I am. Uh, Dana White at optonline.net. Okay. Thanks, Dana, very <laughs> okay. much. And thank you all for watching. If you have any questions that have come up, just don't hesitate giving me a call at 914-941-1111. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good evening. Thanks. <laughs>